My name is Fiza Mughal, and I work uh, in the lab of Professor Gustavo Caetano Anolis. And um, I'm a second year PhD student, and this is a part of my dissertation project. So as the project, uh, as the project name suggests, that we are using dynamics and evolution to study the structure and uh, structure function relationship of proteins. So um, why we want to do that? We want to see to what extent evolution prefers dynamics over structure. And we want to see how um, dynamics correlates along evolution with um, structural changes and how robust these um, dynamics are to um, structural, these structural muta mutations or in interferences. So we are trying to connect these dots uh, using um, billions of years of evolution using nanoseconds of molecular dynamics. Now, protein loops are thought to be critical for function and stability of protein structures. Um, so they are important contribu uh, contributors to functional heterogeneity. They have various roles in proteins. They can confer um, activity, uh, as you can see in the first um, section of this diagram. They can um, assist in intramolecular docking, uh, and they can, uh, there are also signal computation loops. These are, those are a bit longer. Uh, they tend to bring the nanocomputers, the signal computation nanocomputers, so to speak, together to help decipher the signals in the environment. And they confer flexibility, of course, because um, they don't have rigid structures. So they can merely act as linker regions. And they act as docking sites if an enzyme acts upon it. And of course, they act as binding pockets. So uh, now, looking at dynamics and evolution, dynamics and um, flexibility in homologous proteins has been studied to be conserved. Um, two homologous enzymes were taken with different functions. And it was found uh, that there were, um, there, was, uh, there were difference in their dynamics because they had different functions. However, there were um, two enzymes with different structures, but the same function. They showed similar patterns of dynamics. Now, the other thing about this is that the slowest normal modes that account for the extensive motions in these proteins appear to be highly conserved. Now, this so slowest normal mode can be taken as the mean of the motions of this protein, and the other fluctuations that occur in this protein structure can vary along that specific mean. And th these uh, slowest normal modes that are conserved appear to be more uh, robust to sequence mutations. And the, the conservation of flexibility and dynamics in evolution is conserved at three levels, at the residue level, at um, the global, and the global dynamics, which is reflected in the conformational fluctuations is also um, conserved. And then this can also be seen at the assembly level of the protein subunits in a quaternary structure. Now, uh, our research is based on the concept of evolutionary functional loops. This was proposed by Goncharenko and Brzozowski. Now, they postulate that protein functions are, a, are merely a combination of ancestral um, set of activities that are carried out by these ancestral forms of um, protein fragments called elementary functional loops. These elementary functional loops have a catalytic residue, one or more than one uh, in this loop, and then they combine to form these active sites and then multi-domain pr proteins and then complexes. So it is, uh, it is a combination of are canalized loop structures that give rise to these domains. So based on this, uh, colleagues in my lab created the elementary function gnome. Now, the elementary function gnome is a bipartite network that, we, uh, that my colleagues created using these elementary function loops and protein domains. So. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with network analyses, a bipartite network has two types of nodes. And uh, th the links are only established between dissimilar 
types of nodes, not similar nodes. So a link in this bipartite network would be between a loop and a domain. When will that be? Uh, it is when a domain has that particular loop, a link will be established. So based on this bipartite network, projections were created of the domain network and the loop network. So the domain network would have connections if these domains share loops. The loop network would have connections if they're part of, a, of the same domain. Now, this um, elementary function known bipartite network was then plotted along our, uh, the phylogenomic uh, reconstruction of evolutionary timelines of our lab. So the basic uh, and the most important um, result of this, uh, of this study was that recruitment of loops by domains is highly modular with scale-free behavior. Now, this is an important result in the context of um, what we have been looking at in Blue Waters. So the first part uh, of this presentation is based on um, a data set that I borrowed uh, from a study uh, that my colleagues did over the origin of the genetic code. So in this study, they found that flexibility is preferred by the genetic code and its evolution as such. So this study was conducted by using amino acyl tRNA synthetase domains. And they found that the tRNA and amino acyl tRNA synthase domains co-evolve. Uh, so that shows that the genetic, uh, that the origin of the genetic code and um, has intertwined um, evolutionary uh, origins with that of amino acyl tRNA synthase. So genetic code provided the ancestral proteins with flexible unordered regions to um, optimize function. That was one of the main findings of this study. And another study that we did, we found that evolution tends to prefer faster folding speeds and Flexibility, therefore, is a manifestation of this evolutionary preference, which was connected to the study. So I'll not go into the details of this. So, but this is uh, this is a um, diagram I borrowed from this the origin of the genetic code study, in which um, uh, in which my colleagues study the dipeptide compositions, and um, in which they found that there was first a operational code preceding the standard genetic code. And this operational code was rich with dipeptide. Uh, the dipeptides that were found in this operational code were mostly um, uh, uh, enriched in amino acids that were uh, used for amino acyl or uh, tRNA uh, synthetase editing. So now, um, in sync with this, we did the Blue Waters experiment that we did was basically borrow those um, fold family domains that were used in the previous study of the origin of the genetic code. And so we used the corresponding loops in that, um, uh, in that fold family data set. So for that, we used the ArcDB data set. Now this, um, uh, this database has a collection of loops. They classify loops according to two classification systems. One is a density search, and other is the Markov clustering. We use a density search. Um, method for loops uh, because density search loops tend to have the same length. Um, therefore, they are more representative if we just take one um, member of the entire classification. So we came up with 87 RTB classifications that were associated with those domains. And, and we annotated those um, loops to find that there were um, 116 uh, gene ontology molecular functions associated. Uh, not all of these loops had um, these um, molecular function annotations. I'd like to make an important distinction here, that the molecular function annotations are to the loops are not, um, um, are not reflective that this loop is actually involved in the function. If the protein has this, um, uh, is, uh, has this annotation, it will be, it, uh, all the parts of the protein will carry this annotation. So we tried to look for ways. If we could do that, we haven't been successful in finding um, any way that we can uh, isolate the particular loop that is acting in that function. So um, 
after that, after annotating um, with are the loops with molecular functions, we annotated them with evolutionary ages that we uh, derived from the phylogenomic reconstructions of our lab. And then, so our data set has representations, has fair representation from all of the super kingdoms. So this is just the molecular function sharing among the super kingdoms uh, of the loops that are in our data set. So um, after the informatics um, uh, techniques that we used, we moved on to Blue Waters, where we performed the molecular dynamic simulations uh, consisting of 10 nanosecond production run uh, using NAMD 2.9 and JARM 36. So the analysis that we performed were at the global level, RMST and radius of gyration. And at the local level, we looked at, um, at the individuals, uh, individual loops, we looked at their RMSF, PCA, um, dynamic across correlation matrices, and then network analysis based on the networks um, on these DC CMs. So here is the global picture. Now, uh, we plotted the median radius of gyration along the evolutionary timeline. Uh, now, ND is reflective of age. Zero means ancestral. And 1.0 means that it's more modern. So I'll not go into the details of how we um, construct these timelines, but I would I would be glad to explain it to them after the presentation. Um, so, um, so we plotted them along these timelines, and also the median RMST. Now, the reason for plotting them was we wanted to see if there was a trend of increase or decrease, like we had observed for folding speeds in our previous studies. However, we don't tend to see a clear-cut trend. Um, there could be two reasons for that that we thought of that um, domains in the amino acid RNA synthetase proteins tend to occur in uh, combinations, so which can be a problem because they might be interfering. And the other thing is that mostly these domains are, the domains that are involved in this data set are quite ancestral according to our timeline. That's why we have a huge concentration of loops over here. And majority of the loop um, classifications were therefore annotated to the, those ancestral domains. So we do see a little bit of a trend here, but I will not speculate on that. Um, we would like to gather more samples, uh, perhaps use a different data set that is more representative of all these age bins, and then we can be able to make concrete conclusions. However, the local and individual analysis that we did uh, is showing promising results. These are preliminary analysis, ongoing, but it's showing interesting patterns. Now, this is a DCCM of uh, our protein loop that we simulated. It's based on the trajectory that we, um, uh, the trajectory that we got uh, on the blue waters. So this shows um, correlated and anti-correlated motions. Now, based on this, we plotted a network of residues. The residues would have a link if they are correlated in, and correlated or anti-correlated in some fashion in the trajectory. And these um, boundaries show um, these clusters that are moving together or have anti-correlations during the trajectory. And this has been projected onto this loop. And so uh, this is a loop from the phenyl RNA synthetase, and it has these three molecular functions. Now, in our, um, in our data set, we had most of our loops had multiple functions. That is also um, giving us similar problems like that we got with domain combinations. However, that is, uh, we are trying to overcome that. Um, we are thinking of using machine learning techniques for that. And now we also, based on the networks that, uh, that I showed you in the previous slide, we calculated network metrics, visual metrics, betweenness, closeness, degree centrality. Uh, modularity of these communities. However, these two metrics are showing, um, showing us uh, promising results that we would further like to pursue. Um, so the modularity of these communities that we are seeing in those networks tend, tend to exhibit similar patterns, like this scale-free power law modular um, curve that we are observing here. So we would like to analyze it further to, um, to see if, if it is significant, um, using some statistical models as well. 
Um, and from the other network metrics, betweenness also um, was quite prominent because um, the loop region in this uh, loop, uh, the loop region, the flexible region in this loop is from residue 9 to residue 13. So we were expecting that betweenness values of the residue uh, of these loops residues should be higher, but they were not. However, most of the proteins showed um, higher uh, betweenness values in the C terminus. And those are the loops that have functional annotations. So the loops that do not have functional annotations, they were shown chaos, like betweenness values, uh, all the residues were, there was this, that graph was just chaos. However, the only exception that I found to the betweenness values differing from this pattern was the loops that were associated with the DNA binding proteins. Now, those loops had um, betweenness va uh, values that were high betweenness values at the N terminus. So that, was, that is something interesting that we found. However, like I said, we will not speculate on this because you would like to first test the stati statistical significance of these patterns. So our basic goal was to study emotions that are uh, present in the tra trajectories. So for that, we did a PCA to see how many confirmations we are getting. So after doing a hierarchical, hierarchical clustering of this PCA, we found two distinct, distinct confirmations that are going on in these trajectories. So blue shows um, the initial um, confirmations, and um, dark red shows the confirmation at the end of the trajectory. So we would like to, so this is an ongoing analysis, so we would like to use, we would like to pursue these clues that we have found from these um, network metrics further. And the second um, aspect that I would like to discuss is, well, for our experiment is that of metabolic networks that we are um, working on in our current allocation of flu waters. So the next logical step that we thought in our, um, in our, in our uh, project should be to study metabolic enzymes because they are central to sustaining life on Earth. And enzymes seem to be the best candidates to study protein function. So for this, we borrowed meta-consensus enzymes. Now, meta-consensus enzymes are enzymes that have been formed by a consensus of um, three prominent comparative bioinformatics techniques based on sequence, structure, and reaction. So there are six in number. However, to expand the data set, we might use the consensus of sequence and structures to, make, to raise it to 10 enzyme groups, EC groups. Now, these are EC groups to the third level. Those of you who are not familiar with the EC classification, there are four levels of classification, and these are up to the three levels. So in order to summarize um, work by Goldman and colleagues, um, they postulated that these 10 enzymes, these 10 EC groups were um, these 10 uh, EC groups were a part of an ancestral metabolic network that they have just created over here, and that were found bulk of the functions for the ancestral form of life. So the preliminary work we have done in this regard is that we um, took those EC groups, uh, th that EC group, the 10 EC group data set, and then we ran enzyme queries, the corresponding enzymes at the fourth classification level using the metabolic MANET, uh, the Metabolic Molecular Ancestry Network. This is a product of her lab. This was created in 2006, and I updated this to the full family level during my master's thesis. So we switched from fold to fold family level because uh, full families have a stronger evolutionary connection compared to folds. So after that, um, we came up with 12,000 PDB entries uh, corresponding to these, uh, to these 400 enzymes. And then we did, um, uh, in order to use high resolution structures, we used the PISIS server for culling them to 1,600 PDB entries. And then we did hammer assignments, um, from which we singled out the single domain PDB entries in order to avoid the domain combination effect. And then we did age assignment using metabolic MANET. After that, we also did um, Go molecular function uh, annotations. So we came up with around 4,000 molecular functions associated with the set. And then we um, used these um, entries to see if, uh, to find corresponding loops in the ArcDB database, which are about 200 in number. So 
we plan to simulate these loops. Now the next step, we are preparing for simulation of these 200 loops with that. Um, so to conclude with, our, we think our work will help improve homology-based protein structure predictions because um, the dynamics are derived from, a struc from structure which is already conserved, so we will be able to see that effect in dynamics. However, if we can also do prediction of structural dynamics in the absence of high sequence similarity structures available, and um, evolutionary dynamics research has its applications in protein design. Um, if we factor in flexibility and dynamics into a protein design, it um, tends to improve results. A study has shown that. And it has applications in synthetic biology. We will be able to predict the wide array of dynamics of how a protein would behave in an engineered pathway. It has its applications um, uh, in translation medicine, where we um, want to use, if we, want, we might want to um, want to make use of interfering agents, but it, it is kind of a risky prospect to treat a virus with a virus in a human subject. So we want to see the full range of adverse effects of an interfering agent. So that our research might be helpful in these applications. So, and after that, the future directions, as I mentioned, we want to use machine learning classifiers to further expand our analyses. And we are contemplating over using REMD simulations for our next round of simulations. But um, it, uh, it is a comp computationally expensive enterprise based on the allocation we have. So we, might, we may or may not go that route. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, NCSA Blue Waters for the valuable resource, supercomputing resource that they have provided, because our lab has resources for informatics, um, to do informatics uh, analysis, but definitely not molecular dynamics. And I would also like to thank the Blue Waters support team for promptly uh, responding to my questions any time of the day, any time of the night. And <laughs> I'd also like to thank Dr. Frauke Grader, our, uh, the biophysics expert on our team, uh, and also a collabor German collaborator. She leads the molecular biomechanics group at um, Heidelberg Institute of Theoretical Studies. And I'd also like to thank the Evolutionary Bioinformatics Lab members.